Alexander Pope said rather snobbishly that a little learning is a dangerous thing. Thomas Huxley later asked, where is the man who has so much as to be out of danger? Technology is addictive. Material progress creates problems that are, or seem to be, soluble only by further progress. Again, the devil here is in the scale. A good bang can be useful, a better bang can end the world. So far, I've spoken of such problems as if they were purely modern, arising from industrial technologies. But while progress strong enough to destroy the world is indeed modern, the devil of scale who transforms benefits into traps has plagued us since the Stone Age. This devil lives within us and gets out whenever we steal the march on nature, tipping the balance between cleverness and recklessness, between need and greed. Paleolithic hunters who learned how to kill two mammoths instead of one had made progress. Those who learned how to kill 200 by driving a whole herd over a cliff had made too much. They lived high for a while, then starved. Many of the great ruins that grace the deserts and jungles of the earth are monuments to progress traps, the headstones of civilizations which fell victim to their own success. In the fates of such societies, once mighty, complex, and brilliant, lie instructive lessons for our own. Their ruins are shipwrecks that mark the shoals of progress, or, to use a more modern analogy, they are fallen airliners whose black boxes can tell us what went wrong. In these talks, I want to read some of these boxes in the hope we can avoid repeating past mistakes of flight plan, crew selection, and design. Of course, our civilization's particulars differ from previous ones, but not as much as we like to think. All cultures, past and present, are dynamic. Even the most slow-moving were, in the long run, works in progress. While the facts of each case differ, the patterns through time are alarmingly and encouragingly similar. We should be alarmed by the predictability of our mistakes, but encouraged that this very fact makes them useful for understanding what we face today. Like Gauguin, we often prefer to think of the deep past as innocent and unspoiled, a time of ease and simple plenty. Eden and paradise feature prominently in popular book titles on anthropology and history. For some, Eden was the pre-agricultural world, the age of hunting and gathering, for others, it was the pre-Columbian world, the Americas before the white man. And for many, it was the pre-industrial world, the long stillness before the machine. Certainly, there have been good and bad times to be alive. But the truth is that human beings drove themselves out of Eden, and they've done it again and again by fouling their own nest. If we want to live in an earthly paradise, it is up to us to shape it, to share it, and look after it. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Bell Theater at Carleton University in Ottawa, you're listening to Gauguin's Questions, the first of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. In pondering his first question, where do we come from? Gauguin might have agreed with G.K. Chesterton, who remarked, if it is not true that a divine being fell, then we can only say that one of the animals went entirely off its head. We now know much more about that five million year process of an ape going off its head. So it's hard nowadays to recapture the shock felt around the world when the implications of evolutionary theory first became clear. Writing in 1600, Shakespeare had Hamlet exclaim, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in action how like an angel, in apprehension how like a god. 
His audience would have shared Hamlet's mix of wonder, scorn, and irony at human nature. But very few, if any, would have doubted that they were made as the Bible told. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. They were prepared to overlook theological rough spots posed by sex, race, and hair color. Was God black or blonde? Did he have a navel? And what about the rest of his physical equipment? Such things didn't bear thinking about too closely. Our kinship with apes, which seems so obvious now, was unsuspected. Apes were seen, if seen, which was rarely in Europe in those days, as parodies of man, not cousins or possible forebears. If they thought about it at all, most people of 1600 believed that what we now call scientific method would simply open and illuminate the great clockwork set in place by providence, as God saw fit to let humans share in admiration of his handiwork. The inevitable collision between scriptural faith and empirical evidence was barely guessed at. Most of the really big surprises, the age of the earth, the origin of animals and man, the shape and scale of the heavens still lay ahead. Most people of 1600 were far more alarmed by priests and witches than by natural philosophers, though the lines between these three were often unclear. From the biblical definition of man and the common sense principle that it takes one to know one, Hamlet thinks he knows what a human being is, and most Westerners continued to think they knew what they were for another 200 years. The rot of rational doubt on the matter of our beginnings did not set in until the 19th century, when geologists realized that the chronology in the Bible could not account for the antiquity they read in rocks, fossils, and sediments. Some civilizations, notably the Hindu and the Maya, assumed that time was vast or infinite. But ours always had a petty notion of time's scale. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, sighs Rosalind in As You Like It. Half a century later, Archbishop Usher of Armagh and his contemporary John Lightfoot took it upon themselves to pinpoint the very moment of creation. Man was created by the Trinity, Lightfoot declared, on October the 23rd, 4004 BC, at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Such precision was new, but the idea of a young earth had always been essential to the Judeo-Christian view of time as teleological, a short one-way trip from creation to judgment, from Adam to doom. Newton and other thinkers began to voice doubts about this on theoretical grounds, but they had no real evidence or means of testing their ideas. Then in the 1830s, while the young Charles Darwin was sailing around the world aboard the Beagle, Charles Lyell published his Principles of Geology, arguing that the Earth transformed itself gradually by processes still at work and might therefore be as old as Newton had proposed, some ten times older than the Bible allowed. Under Queen Victoria, the Earth aged quickly. <laughs> by many millions of years in decades, enough to make room for Darwin's evolutionary mechanism and the growing collection of giant lizards and low-browed fossil humans being dug up around the world. In 1863, Lyle brought out a book called Geological Evidences of the Antiquity of Man, and in 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man. Their ideas were spread by enthusiastic popularizers. Above all, Thomas Huxley, famous for saying in a debate on evolution with Bishop Wilberforce, that he would rather acknowledge an ape for his grandfather than be a clergyman careless with the truth. <laughs> Hamlet's exclamation, therefore, became a question. What exactly is a man? Like children who reach an age when they're no longer satisfied that a stork brought them into the world, 
a newly educated public began to doubt the old mythology. By the time Gauguin was painting his masterpiece at the end of the century, the first two of his questions were getting concrete answers. By 1907, Boltwood and Rutherford could show that the Earth's age is reckoned not in millions of years, but in billions. Archaeology showed that the genus Homo was a latecomer, even among mammals, taking shape long after early pigs, cats, and elephants began walking the Earth or in the case of whales, gave up walking and went swimming. Man, wrote H.G. Wells, is a mere upstart. What was extraordinary about human development, the one big thing that set us apart from other creatures, is that we leveraged natural evolution by developing cultures transmissible through speech from one generation to the next. The human word, Northrop Fry wrote in another context, is the power that orders our chaos. The effect of this power was unprecedented, allowing complex tools, weapons, and elaborate planned behaviors. Even very simple technology had enormous consequences. Basic clothing and built shelter, for example, opened up every climate from the tropics to the tundra. We moved beyond the ecologies that had made us and began to make ourselves. But though we became experimental creatures of our own devising, it's important to bear in mind that we had no inkling of this process, let alone its consequences, until only the last six or seven of our 100,000 generations. We've done it all sleepwalking. Nature let a few apes into the lab of evolution, switched on the lights, and left us there to mess about with an ever-growing supply of ingredients and processes. The effect on us and on the world has accumulated ever since. What strikes me most forcefully is the acceleration, the runaway progression of change, or to put it another way, the collapsing of time. From the first chipped stone to the first smelted iron took nearly three million years. From that first iron to the hydrogen bomb took only 3,000. The old Stone Age, or Paleolithic era, lasted from the appearance of tool-making hominids nearly three million years ago until the melting of the last Ice Age only 12,000 years ago. It therefore spans more than 99.5% of human existence. During most of that time, the pace of change was so slow that entire cultural traditions replicated themselves generation after generation, almost identically, over staggering periods of time. It might take 100,000 years for a new style or technique to be developed. Then, as culture began to ramify and feed on itself, only 10,000, then mere thousands, and centuries. Cultural change begat physical change and vice versa. Now we have reached such a path that the skills and mores we learn in childhood are outdated by the time we're 30. But I'm getting... Most people living in the old Stone Age would not have noticed any cultural change at all. The human world that individuals entered at birth was the same as the one they left at death. It's possible to imagine exceptions to what I've just said. The generation that saw the first use of fire, for instance, was perhaps aware that its world had changed. But we can't be sure how quickly even that Promethean discovery took hold. Most likely fire was used when available from wildfires and volcanoes for a long time before it was kept. And then it was kept for a very long time before anyone learned it could be made.